this virtual event. It should be oh. it should be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we've we've had a, a um, you know put out a little bit of information on this project before, so I think a lot of people are probably familiar with it. But I think it's a it's a it's a wonderful example of the type of new building uh, technology that will you know be looking for looking to uh, pursue more of in the future. Um, you know, there's no way we're going to uh, achieve our lofty energy goals as a state and as as local communities unless we um, find ways to to uh, build and and rebuild our, our structures in a way that don't use fossil fuels. And uh, this is a, is a lot of really interesting aspects of this project that um, one or the other or all of them may apply to future projects. So um, thanks again, and uh, just turn it over to you guys. I guess I'll let Jeff introduce himself, then I see he's unmuted himself. Yes, uh, I'm Jeff Goldstone. I was the architect for the project. Um, and uh, I will be the narrator for the tour guide. So we have Madison, who, who is actually at the Lake Perrin site right now. Um, I don't know where she is, somewhere in building number three, I suspect. Um, building in a two bedroom, number five. Okay, she's in unit five of building three. And she'll be available to us to walk around and actually point her camera at various things as we talk about them. Um, I also have a series of slides that help illustrate the things that I was asked to speak about and that I thought would be interesting. Um, what I don't know, and I'm not sure whether someone couldn't tell me, I, I don't know most of you and I apologize for that. I know a few of you. Um, I suspect that most of you either have a, uh, a specific interest in energy efficiency in construction or something related to that. Uh, and with that, along with that interest comes at least some amount of knowledge of systems and of construction techniques and the advances in various sorts of, um, of efficiency in construction. Um, so I'm going to make that assumption starting out, but uh, at the same time, I'm happy to dig down deeper into any of the specific uh, items that I talk about, or in fact, to, uh, to, to not go as deep if, if there's less interest in, in sort of the numbers and, and how exactly we got to what we decided to do. Um, and I ask uh, that since Madison and um, who's our second host and Allison, who I've not met, but Allison are our hosts, um, that between the two of them, um, would you like a, there to be just people just speak out when there are questions or do you wanna hold questions till after the presentation, initial presentation, or do you wanna use typed in um, messages for questions. It uh, doesn't matter to me. I think, um, I think it's in, as long as you're not being in um, 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 to have people ask questions as we go along. Is that, a, would that be okay? It's, it's fine with me. Absolutely. So if I'm, if I'm just talking away and somebody, um, get my attention somehow. I'm not sure. I, I'm going to have to read a few, so, you know, some of my notes along the way, so I won't might necessarily be looking at you. Um, but I, I can share my screen now and get started if that's all we need to do. So I will. And hopefully um, this will all work. Um, I can assume, I think, I only see a few of you now, but I can assume you all hear me. And if somebody could signal that you see, Madison, thank you. So you all know the project. Uh, this is the uh, Lake Perrin Village project, um, just over the Shaftesbury line uh, from North Bennington, the village of North Bennington. That was a picture taken this morning. So you can see that the, the grass is starting to grow and the, the leaves have all fallen off our new trees and shrubs. Um, but I just thought uh, as a starting point, be all aware of that project. And now I have to make sure I can figure out how to advance the pages. There we go. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background into the project before we get into the energy efficiency aspects of the construction. It was built on uh, a site that was acquired by Shires from a local um, group that had preserved and, and uh, put the site together over several years. Um, originally, we intended, and I think you can see my cursor Originally, we intended to build on the northern section or the northeastern section of the site in the area that I'm outlining here. 
and we designed, uh, preliminarily designed for that site. And um, after comments were received from some of the neighbors, um, we agreed and decided to move to this section of the site closer to the town line. Um, you can see from this, uh, <coughs> from this site plan that it's a rather steep site, um, which, and a very narrow site, in fact, and that was challenging for us, um, as you'll see in the grading. So this is the site plan, and you can see by the contour lines how difficult some of the grading was. Um, and for the most part, this is how it is. We did, in fact, um, find that we had a, a great deal of uh, gravel that we can mine from this area. So building four, which is, also, which is here, now has a much larger backyard, a uh, flat backyard, which is kind of nice. Um, some of the steeper slopes uh, gave us a challenge because one of the commitments we had to the funders was that the site would be um, would conform to a, to a number of universal design commitments, and so, in fact, there are no ramps on this site, and everything is paths. So every every path you see there is at under five percent slope, so it should be easily um, uh, it should be easy for people who are in wheelchairs. Now, the the driveway itself is steeper, but all the paths are. Uh, at those slopes. Um, we are on town water. We were able to get onto town water. The new water line came through on Perrin Road while we were working on the project. And we are also on town sewer. So our water is supplied by um, the North Bennington Water District and our sewer uh, connection is, is with Bennington. Uh, although we are, the project itself is actually in Shaftesbury. Um, one other thing to notice is that this is Lake Perrin right here. Uh, no, sorry, right here, <laughs> right off the pit page. This is Lake Perrin wreck. And we have a path, and there it is here, that comes through the woods and actually uh, gives access directly to the Lake Perrin Recreation Center from the, from the site. The path was just completed a couple of weeks ago. A closer view of the, same, um, of the same site plan. And the site plan is exactly as it was built, with the exception of we have had a uh, little extra cash at the end, and we're able to build a picnic deck in that area that's under construction now. The four buildings that are on the site um, are, three of them are six unit buildings, and the, the fourth is a four unit building, and the entire, the, the whole site is uh, out, summarized in this little table on, the, on there. I don't know whether, it depends, I guess, on the size of your screens, whether or not you can, uh, you can read what I'm showing you. But um, the total square footage on the site is on the, in the neighborhood of a little under 20,000 square feet of, of space. Uh, every, every unit has its own entrance. There are no common areas. There are no elevators. Um, most of the units are duplexes, having an internal staircase. Um, there are two handicap units, and the units are all one, two, and three bedrooms. OK, so now into the building science parts of this. Um, oh, let me let me just say one thing because I like to tell people that you'll see that these two two buildings, buildings one and two, are uh, mirror images or very close to being mirror images of one another. Um, and the the uh, inception of that was uh, a pair of buildings in Salem and a pair of buildings in um, uh, in Arlington. They're in both cases, uh, well, at least in the case in the ones in Arlington. I understand they were built by a farmer for his two daughters to encourage them to stay on the farm after after they married and, uh, and they were built to two identical houses. And they're, it's fun to look at them because over the years they've evolved into very different houses, but they started identical. And there's a similar pair up in Salem. I always found that interesting. And of course we were trying to be somewhat, well, we were trying to be um, respectful of, of the style of houses in the area. And although they're good sized buildings compared to most of the houses, they're, they're very much farmhouses. And these two buildings, the buildings three and four sit further back from the road. So you're, you're seeing the front of each of these buildings in this image. This is a building section um, through one of the buildings. Uh, it's building section through building one. Um, I'm gonna use that as a way of illustrating some of the technologies that we, uh, we chose to use in, um, and by the way, these are all technologies that are sustainable and, and increase the energy efficiency of the building or of the construction itself, or some, of course, both. Um, another thing in, in pre preface to seeing all these pictures, um, there were changes made during construction, uh, quite a number of changes. 
And we were able to, in fact, become an all electric site, as Jim mentioned at the beginning, um, although we didn't know we were going to do that when we started construction. So there was some redesign going on during construction. And um, I'm gonna to try to illustrate that, but some of the, some of the, um, the images that I'll show you have the earlier construction doc, are from the earlier construction documents, and then some of them show where the changes were made. So this is a building section through building one. Um, and what I wanna illustrate first is what's called the frost protected shallow foundation. And if you can imagine that this is gr the grade line here, I'll get it closer up in a moment. There's a grade line where I'm pointing here that our foundation extends only about uh, 18 inches below grade, uh, which is unusual for our climate. And out, I, I'd ask Madison to show us this, but it's, this is all invisible now, of course. Um, normally we are building at least five feet below grade. That's what's required by our building code. But the building code actually says below frost, five feet or below frost. So what we, what we do with the technology of a frost protected shallow foundation is we raise the frost line. So rather than building down to where the frost is so that our building is supported by stable earth, we raise the frost. Roger, I can't off. use the little oven. Um, somebody has their microphone on there. Oops. So <laughs> that's okay. Um, so rather than, uh, I'm going to go into this in more detail in a moment, but rather than support it on uh, naturally a never freezing soil five feet down, or five feet or more down below grade, we actually bring the frost line up to a point where we can build on top of it uh, at a much shallower. And we do that by insulating. So what you see on the right is a wall section of uh, building one again, it's one and two, they're the same. And you can see the way that the frost protected shallow foundation was intended. And then on the left side is a close up of that, but is, it is updated to the um, higher energy efficiency standards that we actually built to. So let me go into a couple details here. And this is where I'm gonna dive into the weeds a little bit for those of you who are interested. And somebody can yell at me and say, I, I, it's too much if you prefer not, that I don't do that. So you can see that there's, there's a, uh, a haunch on the edge of the concrete to bring it down to the 18 inches. And then underneath the concrete is a gravel base or a crushed stone base. Those are required in order to build uh, to make sure that that uh, any water that does build up underneath has a way to drain out and there is a drain below. This um, area of, of gravel actually caused us some problems. It's it's around all the buildings where the drip, the, the water drips off the roof so that it doesn't just eat away at the grass, splash back up against the buildings. And what it did unfortunately was it itself has to be drained in order to be uh, conformed with the stormwater management requirements but it allowed with this crushed stone, it allowed the cold air to get further down towards our foundations. So this, this insulation out here, this wing insulation, you can see it's thicker here and thinner here. Um, it's four inches thick and then two inches thick. And that was because we were concerned about the cold air actually being able to freeze the soils. And we added additional insulation in that area. So again, the concept of a frost protected shallow foundation is to keep the ground from freezing. Many people confuse these with what is what are known as Alaskan slabs. Alaskan slabs or Arctic slabs um, are a similar type of construction, but the purpose of those is that they're insulated to keep the ground from thawing, not the ground from freezing. So as long as you're on stable frozen ground, you can build just like as long as you're on stable thawing ground, you can build. It's when it freezes and thaws that you have problems. So these are very different from Alaskan slabs. We don't build Alaskan slabs in our climate. Um, hey, Jess? Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt. This is Wayne Goodman. Uh, just out of curiosity, on the, um, the area around the perimeter area where you have gravel all the way up to grade, if that area were, and I'm assuming you're doing that because of no gutters and you wanted to provide a drip, a drip channel for the roof, if if you were to put gutters in and make that just be soil, would that be, would you still need the wing, in, uh, the wing insulation or would that do away with the wing insulation? Great, great, good question. Leads me right into what I was about to talk about. But the, the short okay. answer is, the shorter answer is yes, we would, we would have been able to build without wing insulation under one of the two scenarios that we considered. And I'll go, I'm going to go into that right now, but um, 
the what I was getting to was why we have more insulation in the first two feet than in the second two feet. Um, you know, where, why this is thicker than this. And that was purely uh, to cover the unknown. We didn't have any data to tell us how much cold air would actually filter through two inch or uh, 18 inches, I think it is, of crushed stone relative to soil. And all of the data we used to calculate and to, to design the frost protected shallow foundations presumed that that would be soil and not, and not uh, crushed stone. But it leads me right into the question of the wing insulation. Because if you look over here, we did have wing insulation, but it was only two feet. That was our original design. But we also did not have insulation underneath the slab. Okay, so when we upgraded the, the thermal envelopes, we added the insulation under the slab. And that kicked us from the design criteria for frost protected shallow foundations, which are for heated buildings, where some of the heat from the building drives down into the, into the soil and therefore keeps the soil from freezing, to when we put the insulation under the entire slab, to have to assume that less heat goes through. Now, obviously the insulation keeps the, air, the heat from the earth from coming up, so it, it acts for, you know, it separates the two, the two but out of, uh, I've done several of these uh, in heated buildings where we have insulated slabs, I've always resorted in putting the wing insulation in that would not have otherwise been required by code. We're, our climate puts us right on the edge of needing or not needing the wing insulation. So I have, sometimes we've done it and sometimes we've not done it. Um, I think it's good practice to do it and it certainly benefits the building because you get a larger envelope of warm soil underneath the building. So we did increase this because of the uh, because we increased the wing insulation because we increased the under slab insulation. So the buildings benefited in both ways. Um, interestingly, during uh, construction, we, these are some photos of the construction uh, ongoing. And, and well, let me, let me talk about the construction itself because you can see this is very different looking from a standard excavation for a building. You know, basically it's just a deep haunch around the outside of the building, some haunches on the interior where we're going to have bearing walls and a very shallow edge. It's one concrete pour. They're not three. Normally you have footings, foundation walls, and slabs. This is one concrete pour done in one day for each of the buildings. So we have literally have four pours on these four buildings. Um, so that was, a, that was a big advantage. Less excavation, less backfill, and, and less concrete. Um, what you're seeing here, for those who are not familiar in the yellow, that's, that is a, uh, a vapor barrier, a heavy vapor barrier that went underneath the slab. The stone is not, the stone is covered here, so you can't see it, but um, uh, the stone will be on top of the vapor barrier. I'm sorry, under the vapor barrier, pardon me. And then on the third photo at the bottom, you can see the, the insulation that went around the edges after the concrete was poured and the forms were removed. On the left-hand side of the, of, the pay, of the sheet or the, of the um, slide, you see a monitor that is, act, is currently monitoring three um, ground probes, three ground sensors that were put. Uh, three of the buildings had these buildings. Um, uh, we did not put it under building four just because of the timing, but buildings one, two, and three. Um, and we were monitoring the temp ground temperatures underneath the slab, underneath the footing or the egg, the haunch and outside the haunch. And we did that um, until we were pretty confident that the temperatures were going up and not down. But over the course of last winter, and we did have, we didn't have a terrible winter, but we did have some cold days and we never got anywhere too close to freezing down there. So we were confident that um, we were okay for last year and that was gonna be the only year this, these buildings aren't heated. It will, get, uh, it will get better in future years. And the probes are still down there and Shire zones that little, that little electronic device. So they could still check if they want to in, in upcoming years. Um, so one of the things um, we did, we, I mentioned that, that we saved a lot of time with one concrete pour for each building. We saved on um, the excavation and backfill. Um, we also saved about one cubic yard of concrete for every linear foot of concrete around the perimeter of the buildings. So we saved considerably on the amount of concrete we used on the site. I think that was the right calculation. And we ended up saving about $60,000 um, on the concrete pricing as compared to a full foundation. I honestly think if we really broke it down, we probably could have saved more than that, but that was the number that we were given. Um, 
maybe I should stop and actually ask if there are any questions about Frost Protective Shell Foundations, because uh, I'm going to go on to something else next. Jeff, it's not about that, but we did get a question in the chat um, that maybe you can save for later or answer now. Um, it was about the um, resistance. Was there any resistance from any source during construction? Um, if so, how was it overcome? I think that's referring to, you know, doing more green practices than we had originally planned. All right, yeah, um, resistance. I, uh, there's resistance to spending more money. And, and that's, you know, th these things, and, you know, Stephanie Lane is on the line here. She could talk to that better than I can. The budgeting of these projects is, is always difficult. And so when we push higher energy efficiency, we have to explain why that's a good investment. In every case, higher energy efficiency is going to save money down the road because we're going to spend less money heating these, these buildings. And, um, so there's resistance to spending more money. We could have gone further. We could have gone further in a lot of places on this site. Um, and we discussed, you know, we discussed that. Um, we didn't do everything we would have liked to have done. But that said, I think we as a team um, made decisions to, uh, you know, find less expensive alternatives to get the better building. And I will talk about, I'll talk about it a little more, but I'm not, if that's the type of resistance you're talking about, I would say there was no resist, no outside resistance whatsoever. Um, there was, uh, there was only, uh, there was only enthusiasm, I think, in, in, about, about improving the building envelopes, except the monetary one. I, I guess there is an exception. The Frost Protected Shell Foundations, there was resistance from the contractor. Um, so if that was the question, uh, the contractor was, was, encouraging us not to do them at the beginning. Um, I had never done frost protective shell foundations on a building of this size. It is code, it is allowed by code. The code officials um, understand that, or at least they look it up and they understand it after they look it up. But um, I think there was enthusiasm once we got started for it. Um, the consideration of adding the additional um, insulation that I was showing here uh, on the first two feet was actually a suggestion made by the contractor. And so that wasn't resistance, but it was a, it was a concern. It was to allay a concern that he brought to the table. But once he brought it to the table, I think we all shared, shared the concern. So I would say there was no, not that I can really think of, not much resistance. So the next topic I wanted to talk about was um, what I'm referring to here as high R value insulations. Um, now, I call it high R for the type of construction we're doing. This, this is a very high R value um, construction. There are many people building buildings with much higher R values. Um, we're doing buildings with higher R values. But again, we're looking at a balance. We're looking at a very high performance building um, and trying to find ways to do that economically and practically. So in terms of the, uh, the construction, you'll see that the stud wall is here. That's the structural stud wall. It's fully insulated. We have exterior insulation all the way up to the top, and we have quite a quite a deep, quite deep insulation up in the attic. Um, once again, by the way, you're seeing the before and after. So this was the original construction detail. These were the revised construction details after we did the under slab insulation and um, changed the insulation in the walls. I'll get to that in a moment. So the actual. Um, insulations we used. We used dense pack cellulose insulation. So cellulose is, ours was a pre-consumer waste uh, recycled paper product. So it's not actually shredded newspaper, it's shredded newsprint. Um, and it's put into the walls under high, high density so that it's about three and a half, uh, three, four and a half, four and a half pounds per cubic foot. So it's not quite like picking up reams of paper, but it's quite dense. And when you're in that and pushing on it, it's kind of like pushing on a hard mattress. And it's, uh, it's sandwiched between the exterior sheathing and, the, um, and, and a fabric that's put on the walls before, the, before it's blown in. So we had an R20.9 calculated in the dense pack cellulose of the buildings of the studs. On the exterior of the building, we used EPS foam. That's, um, there's EPS and XPS. XPS is the blue or pink foam everybody's familiar with. EPS is the white foam, the kind of the styrofoam packing foam. It's just a much higher density version of the same thing. Um, it tends, it's, it is not as high R value per inch, 
but it is um, the blowing agents are have lower uh, global warming potential, and so it's a preferred uh, it's a preferred insulation in that regard. So we have three inches of exterior EPS on all the buildings. You can see it going up here over the zips. This is zip sheathing. Uh, most people have probably seen it in green. It's available green and red. Uh, it's the same stuff. That's the zip sheathing of, uh, and then the white is the insulation going on. Um, actually, I, I think I can zoom in on this. Let me see if I can. No, I guess I can't. I can't. I can't do it while I'm presenting. Um, what I was going to zoom in on was to show you that around each of the windows is an insulated window buck. So before we put the windows in, we actually build out the wall around the windows to mount the windows in. And that's an insulated build out as well. And then we bring the other insulation to that. Um, that's a way of keeping the, you know, supporting the windows because the windows themselves cannot be supported by the foam. So again, uh, three inches of EPS foam is another R13.8. So our total insulation in the walls is just under 35, an R35. And for those of us used to building two by six walls with fiberglass bats in them, you know, that's an R19. So we're at 35. Foundation insulation we've already talked about. You can see here the wings and then the vertical insulation around the concrete slab. And again, four inches of EPS, and that's an R18 and two inches of the outer wing in our 9.2, three and three quarters inches going up the slab edge. And that's simply so it, it uh, matches up with the rest of the construction, that funny thickness. Three and three quarters is an R15 and two inches under the slab itself, which of course you can't see here. And then up in the attic, we have 16 inch or 17 inches of cellulose loose sprayed insulation. It does, um, uh, over time, it compacts um, to a little less than that. Uh, or I guess it compacts to 17 inches, and that gives us an R60. All of these insulation values exceed the code, and they all exceed the energy code, and they all exceed the, um, the stretch energy code. Stretch code is used in Vermont for Act 250 projects and projects in certain towns um, and cities that have adopted um, the stretch code is their code, and uh, Bennington is not, or Shaftesbury is not, but um, but because it's an Act 250 project, we were required to to uh, meet the the um, higher codes of stretch code, the higher values of the stretch codes. I do want to mention something about the dense pack uh, cellulose because this is this to me is really important and also often um, ignored. Uh, dense pack cellulose is more expensive than fiberglass, and I believe, I strongly believe it performs much better. But in terms of putting them in the walls, I'm calling that an R20.9, but I said before, cell, uh, fiberglass will be an R19 in the same cavity. Not a big difference. However, um, there, is, there are studies that have looked at well-installed well cellulose compared to typical fiberglass. And typical fiberglass, they say in a wall, uh, performs to about 60% of the 19. Whereas a typical cellulose in a wall performs at about 100, 150% of the 20.9. So we are getting a far, far better uh, performance of, of the insulation. I cannot give you this in, that data, by the way. I've been, I've been trying really hard to get my hands on the physical data, but these studies were apparently done at, um, uh, the, what's the laboratory in Tennessee, the, the big uh, federally run lab, anyway. Um, the other thing about the dense pack cellulose is it's, although it's not an air barrier, it is an air, it, air really can't move through it, whereas fiberglass is, is just a big filter. So this does also deaden the airflow in, within the wall cavity, which is an advantage because it, um, it minimizes convective losses. Um, so air sealing is the next thing I want to talk about. Oh, questions about the insulation. So I'll stop again at the end of each of these. Are there any questions about our insulation and how we handle that? Madison, any other questions that came up? Um, it's Oak Ridge Lab that you were searching for. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, whoever gave me that. Um, that you have. Wayne also said cellulose is significantly quieter, so it works better in sound walls, which we Yes, yeah, so I thank you for that too. I was going to talk about um, the sound, and we might as well do that now. Um, it was a building on this site, we were always concerned because uh, whereas on the northern half of the site, we are somewhat further from the railroad tracks. On this, um, on this site, 
very, very close to the railroad tracks. In fact, when we had job meetings on the site, um, either in the job trailer or outside after COVID, um, the, it would, we'd have to just simply stop when the, when the track and the trains went by because it was so loud. Um, we had a job meeting, the first job meeting we held inside one of the units when it was far enough along that we could be inside. Um, I suddenly noticed looking out the window that there was a train going by and it was, yes, you could hear it slightly, but the difference is amazing. Um, and it is in large measure because of the cellulose and also due to the actual tightness, the air sealing of the building itself. And that's what I'm gonna get to next. So the code, and this is the stretch code as well as the uh, energy code, uh, standard energy code, requires us to have an air sealing strategy and an air sealing goal. And we set that goal at two air changes per hour at 50 pascals of pressure. So that's something that's measured after the construction is completed. And basically you pressurize the building to 50 pascal difference between exterior and interior. And you just, you, you measure how much air it takes to hold it 50 pascals divide that by the volume of the building and you get a number of air changes per hour. Um, so we were looking to be at two air changes per hour under 50 pascals of pressure. That's equivalent to like a 60 mile an hour wind beating against the building. So that's not what you would normally have during most days, but it's what you'd have during a big storm, but it's the way we measure it. Um, I think it, the passive air loss they say is about one tenth that. So whereas we are looking for two air changes an hour in typical everyday life that would be about two air changes an hour that you'd have to heat the air. Um, so this, this um, section and the, and the details that are, that are around it, um, those details are taken from other parts of the construction details and they're just keyed to, the, to where they apply. And the point of this, and, and you can see the heavy dashed line that goes around the building section is to illustrate to the contractor and, and whoever else is interested of what are the strategies to, um, to maintain an airtight envelope. So we, we designed each of these locations, all seven of the ones that are illustrated here, to be airtight. And we expected if they were built by a very good contractor, they could probably be well tighter than the two air changes an hour that we had specified. That was how we went into the job. When we decided to go the next step, to go to the all electric, we also decided to go to a new technology for air sealing. Some of what you see here, we abandoned. And I'm gonna come back to that, but particularly this detail here, which is the where, where non-bearing walls come up and hit the ceiling. And this detail here, which is where the exterior wall supports the roof. Um, in both cases, and I, I will show you this detail in a moment, but in both cases, the challenge would, was getting the air barrier from the outside, which was our zip wall, to the air barrier on the inside, which was our sheetrock on the ceiling. How do, you jump the, how do you jump the air barrier across without creating an air leak? And we did that by putting a plate across the top of the wall and taping it and caulking it accordingly. We eliminated those jumpers when we did the, the aero barrier. We thought we'd save some money. We saved a few thousand dollars and um, regretted it later. These are some of the other details we use for air sealing. So you can see we go to great, great lengths to show exactly, and if you looked at these at larger scale, you would see exactly how every piece is taped to or caulked to every adjacent piece throughout the entire building. I'm not gonna bore you with these, but the window heads, the window jams, the window sills, um, the tops of the walls at the party walls. So this is, the, this is the two studs that go up between the units, the tops of the walls at the exterior wall, where the, the um, interior non-bearing partitions hit the trusses at the base of the walls where we have the vapor barrier, that yellow vapor barrier come up and how we tie that and connect that to the, to the zip panels. We really detailed this every little bit of it. Had it been built perfectly, never, nothing's very perfect in the field. Had it been perfectly, it would have been an airtight envelope. Had it been built according to these details, I know it would have been far better than two air changes an hour. But we decided to use a technology called Aero Barrier. So let me go a little bit into what Aero Barrier is. Um, Aero Barrier is an aerosolized or aerosolized acrylic caulk. So you can see these little sprayers in here. Um, those little sprayers uh, spray what is, looks like a, almost a thick milk, which is acrylic caulk into the air inside the units. 
you can see in the far distance this red thing. That's the blower door. So that is blowing air into the, I took this through a window. I wasn't standing in the space, but you, it, it had just started. So the cloud of, of aerosol had not yet developed, but that, that blower door is pressurizing the building, in this case to 70 Pascals. And that air as it pumps into the building is finding every little gap in the building and trying to find its way out. The aerosol, the aerosol that gets into the air then blows out through all those little openings. And as it hits those little openings, it sticks and fills the gaps. It's a brilliant, uh, a brilliant technology and it works incredibly well. Um, and we learned our lesson as we went and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to the, 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 both the lesson and also to the, um, the quality of air seal that we eventually got. But the technique of doing this was really fascinating. And I think all of us who stood there watching it the first day were excited by the um, tech. I think, I think there's a picture here of all of us standing out there in the freezing weather, watching the, watching the installer set up and then lecture us on how it worked. Um, so there's that same aerosol, aerosol spray. And you can see he's mon literally monitoring the, the whole thing on a computer while, he, while it was going. And, this device here was was keeping the the, uh, the two components of the caulk flowing through the sprayers all the time. And this is the blower door being put in the in the door. There's a heater in the blower door to keep the temperatures up, et cetera, et cetera. It's a great technology. Um, and then while the, while it's going, um, you can watch on that on that monitor this little bar. So this, this little, I don't know if anybody can read it. I can read it on my screen, hopefully you can. But you're seeing here that it started at six, at about 450 CFM. So cubic feet per minute of air was blowing into, the, into this unit. This was unit 3A, building three, unit A. The other end of the building four, Madison is now. Um, this was the first building we did. Started around 450 CFM and it dropped down incredibly quickly. In 40 minutes, he was at, about 70 CFM. And then over the next 100 minutes got down to, I would guess this is probably around 10 CFM. So 10 cubic feet per minute being pumped into that building through what was left of the holes in, the, in, in all of the construction. I thought that was, it was a great result, but it wasn't the result we got in the first unit. So the unit that Madison is in right now, you can't see it now, the two units at the end of the building, there they are. Um, didn't have graphs that looked anything like this. And I didn't put them in this presentation, but the graph at those buildings didn't take two hours to get from 450 down to 10 CFM. They took something more like um, 18 hours and they didn't get that far. Now, was that, it was a mistake in my mind for the installer to continue to continue to pump that caulk into the air for 18 hours, hoping it would continue to go down because it really stopped. What we discovered though was on his advice, we had taken those little jumpers out from the walls in the attic, we saved a few thousand dollars, the ones I was talking about. But those jumpers gave us far less than a quarter inch crack. When we took them out, there were some big cracks that we hadn't anticipated. And the biggest one, I don't have pictures of this to, to illustrate it, but the biggest one was when they framed the stairs, they didn't sheetrock behind the ledger. In other words, the, the, what, the, the structure that held the stair up was nailed off directly to the studs that separated the buildings. So the air just flowed freely through that construction. And when it got to the attic, since those little jumpers weren't there, there was nothing to stop it from going up through into the attic and then into the atmosphere. So 18 hours was not enough to seal these very large holes. So what we learned very quickly was we had to seal the little hole or the big holes, but we didn't have to seal the little holes. And as we went through the process, we, and I say we, because I think um, John Unger Murphy, who owns Murphy Celtech, which is the company that did the installation, learned along with us how important it was to deal the big holes and to ignore the little holes. But we, we all learned that together. In any case, um, the results of this were, astounding. We had changed our goals from two air changes an hour to 0.2 air changes an hour. In other words, one tenth the amount of air. Um, and we not only achieved the 0.2, we actually got, um, we got down to 0.07 on several of the units. 
And uh, the, the highest we had in any unit was 0.15. These are what he calls near zero. Basically, these are thermoses. There's, there's no way to go much further than that because it's not even within the ability of the equipment to measure when it gets that low. So we were able to get to almost airtight um, uh, envelopes, and uh, that which is what we were trying to achieve. But I need to distinguish between air leakage and air infiltration. Um, these two, two terms are used interchangeably. What he was able to do was give us zero air leakage. But at the end of the project, Efficiency Vermont came back and measured the air infiltration. Now we are still excellent. These performed excellently. And I don't have the final results from Efficiency Vermont yet. But we are down closer to point, maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, instead of that 0 0.07 or 0.15 uh, air changes per hour. That still puts us considerably below passive house standards, which are the highest standards out there, which are 0.6 air changes per hour on three of the four buildings. And the small building, because it does have much more envelope related to uh, when compared to um, square footage uh, or volume, it, uh, it, it came in around 0.7 air changes per hour. So nearly passive house. Although once they do their calculations, I really don't know exactly where that's going to be. So the difference is that I believe the biggest difference is the kitchen vent hoods. Um, when we did the when we did the aero barrier installation, we had all of those taped off because we didn't want to seal the dampers, and the the uh, caulk would actually have sealed them. But once we take those off and we're relying on things like dampers, plastic dampers, to keep the building airtight, I think that's where we lost a lot of our efficiency. And also, I am afraid to say, I'm sorry to say, I think some of the plumbing and electrical work that was done after the aero barrier was done also to in, uh, introduce new holes in the envelope. And I say that because we have a very uneven difference between the original and what Efficiency Vermont measured. Uh, one other thing I want to mention um, is we did do each of the units independently, as you see, uh, and they were comp uh, because we wanted to have, not only because it was, it was practical to do that, but that was allowing us to carpent, <laughs> I can never say this word, compartmentalize <laughs> the building. So now smells in one unit won't get into the next unit. Sounds from one unit will be somewhat more obscured you know, before they get into the next unit. So that was an advantage to the, uh, the project. Um, air sealing. Any questions about air sealing? Got a couple in the chat. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I can't see the chat, so. Okay. We've got a question from Dixie Zenz. He asked, uh, where does the dew point occur in your walls? He said, I have polyiso four inch foam sheets. Yep. And the dew point resides so no condensation or need for vents to dry condensation. Right, and we our, our dew point occurs, um, well, okay. We had, we did have this analyzed um, a couple times um, and we believe the dew point will always occur in the um, dense pack. So inside the, uh, the sheathing, and that was the goal. Um, it's true, polyiso is gonna be able to give you that in the same number of inches better than the, uh, the EPS. I, I don't worry about it in this project for both because I believe that we don't have a vapor drive, a huge vapor drive, um, which is good. And also because I do believe that the dew point will occur in the, uh, in the dense pack and before it gets to the sheathing. But finally, because if there ever were a condition where a little bit of condensation occurred on the inside of the sheathing, dense pack is wonderfully efficient in dispersing that moisture. So even a drop or two of water or a cup of water spilled in the dense pack after a day or so, it, it is of course, the, the moisture is still there. It hasn't dried out and it will take a while for it to dry to the inside, but um, the increase in relative humidity that occurs within the dense pack or the, as it disperses is, is minor. So I, I think we have belts and suspenders to make sure that we don't have a, um, any kind of a vapor problem inside the wall. Uh, but it does lead me into the ventilation question, which is gonna be the next thing I wanna talk about. But go ahead, yeah, Madison, there was another question. Yeah, Bill Christian asked, um, did air seal cause problems with window seals or door seals? No, and I'm pleased that that question was asked. Um, I thought they were going to tape off the, well, well, okay, doors first. Doors are easy. Only building three has back doors. So in the case when the blower door is installed, we don't have to worry about door seals where the blower door is. 
The back doors, however, have they have uh, um, standard, you know, factory um, weather stripping, and I was quite quite concerned that we would have a problem because that weather stripping is only as good as it is. It turned out we had none, and that means that there was no leakage, no no appreciable leakage at the at those um, uh, at the doors. In terms of windows, same thing. I thought they were going to tape them off because we don't have passive house windows on this job. We couldn't afford them. We have a basic, you know, it's a, it's a Marvin um, window. It's a good window, but it's not a great window. And uh, we couldn't afford to take that next leap to triple glazing into the higher end windows. And every window still operated. I, I heard no reports of there being a leak that caused a weather stripping to, to stick anywhere in it. So I was really pleased by that. Interestingly, while the, well, just once I was taking that picture, I was standing outside um, the, I guess it was uh, one of the, the building three units looking in through the door. This is the one that has the back doors. And I noticed a little leak in the glazing unit because there's, there's glazing in the doors. And I could see the, the uh, caulk actually coming out through it. And it, it, as soon as it came to the outside, it just gelled on the, uh, on the glass. But it lasted about two minutes. And after about two minutes, it sealed up that, that, uh, that leak. That was in one of the units that did very badly. In the end, it took 18 hours and didn't get the air seal. But nonetheless, um, I was impressed by the fact that it really was doing what it said it was going to do. Is there another one too, Madison? Yep, this is a quick one. Just um, did you share this data with Bruce Harley? I don't know Bruce Harley. Me neither. So, Wayne, do you know? Do you want to introduce? Yeah, I, it's sort of more of a joke than a real question. Um, those of you, any of those, those of us who have been in the energy business for a long time, um, Bruce Harley used to do the um, the early energy code adoption uh, uh, webinars, the day day long webinars. And one of the things that he used to talk about with air sealing was the first place you look is places you can crawl through. You seal those up. The second place is places you can throw a cat through. And then when you get to that point, you know, you're pretty safe it, to begin with. But if you wanted to go further, then you look for the deeper crack or for the smaller cracks. Yeah. So I, I'm sure that he would be extremely interested if he doesn't already know in um, the the quantum leap in air tightness from this technology. I mean, yeah. this is because this is, he lives in this area, in this region in New England. So and it would be really I, you'd be interested in knowing. Yeah, and we're we're fairly early adopters. I mean, we're by no means the first. You know, there are two companies doing this in Vermont. That's all. They're, well, one of them I think it's all is doing full time, and the other company is is trying to build the business out of it. And um, so there are a lot of other a lot of other projects doing this, and we're you know these kinds of results are what they're getting everywhere. Um, there are the the skeptics, and I can't say that they're wrong. I hope very much that they are. That this is a great technology and that it ends up lasting a long, long time. I'm convinced that it, it does what it says it's gonna do. I'm convinced that it does it in a way we can't do it with tape and care, especially in a project that has a budget. And most of the projects we're looking at do have budgets, but I am not convinced. Um, I, 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 don't, I can't argue that this is gonna be the, the end all and be all of air sealing because it's not been around long enough to check it. But it is basically the same technology that's been used in duct sealing for a, quite a long time. So spraying right. the yeah, same sealant into ducts, pressurizing them the same way has been used to seal ducts. It's a slightly different formulation made by the same company. So I have some sense that that, that makes sense. And caulk has always been the better alternative to tape. So, you know, people were late adopters to tape. They didn't want, like, they didn't want to use tape. How long is tape going to last? We don't know the answer to that yet, but it's looking pretty good. Caulk was the, at least in my experience, caulk was used before tape as a better alternative. You know, it doesn't, you know, caulk when, when, it's, when it sees the weather is going to have to be refurbished over time, but caulk when it's between two pieces that are deep inside of wall cavity, seems to me it's gonna be a pretty stable um, seal. I hope so. I agree, and I think the other part of that that makes a big difference is that um, because the caulk is finding its locations based on an air differential, um, I think there's less likelihood of it working its way out over time. Whereas if you were caulking, you know, just doing a normal caulking job, um, you, it, you're at the mercy of how, how hard whoever's caulking is pressing. But the way it was being done, when you're doing it under air pressure, um, that seal is going to be there for a long time. 
Yes, it, it does take the human factor out of it, which is, I, I think, a good thing in that regard. Um, so in any case, that's, that's the end of the Airsium presentation. What you see in front of you now is, is the final data that we got for all of them. Uh, I don't really have any interest in going through this in detail, but it does look at, um, it does look not only at the uh, ACH50, the air change per hour, but it also looks at the CFM per square foot of envelope, as well as the CFM per square foot of five-sided envelopes, discounting the, 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 um, uh, the slab. And, and basically it's, it's simply illustrating that we blow away any standard that you might have at, at this point. Obviously, once, once we open up that one vent in the house, we don't have it anymore. We're still pretty good. So I, I showed you these slides. Um, ventilation. So uh, somebody asked about um, condensation, but then condensation occurs when you have high um, uh, relative humidity in, in a space and, and that the uh, moisture works its way into a wall or into some other, in, onto something else. Of course, it also condensation occurs on the inside of windows. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's something that people don't like to see in their houses. Um, I suspect that there will be some issues associated with condensation in these buildings because although we are ventilating to code, we are not ventilating way beyond code. So we, each of these units does have an ERV, an energy recovery ventilation system. It's ducted. I'm showing you both the cutaways of the ERV that is installed, um, which is a, um, uh, I'm forgetting the brand name, which is embarrassing. Um, but anyway, it's a 70 CFM ERV with a 110 CFM boost. Um, and if you can see on this floor plan, this is, I gave you, this is a one story unit rather than a duplex showing the ERVs are mounted over the washers and dryers. Oh, Madison can show this to us. This is something she can actually show us. Um, they're mounted over the washers and dryers in a compartment with a, with a, uh, uh, an access panel. Um, so they're easy to access for changing filters and they exhaust air from the bathrooms and from the kitchens and they provide fresh air to the bedrooms. That's consistent in all the units. Um, so Madison's showing us where it is right now. There it is. You don't have a screwdriver to open that for us, do you? So twice a year they're going to have to open that up. I forgot it and I was halfway here and I went, ah, I forgot my screwdriver. Okay, well there it is. And it's, in most cases, it's mounted right up in the panel over the over the washer and dryer, um, and it, it's it's fairly easy to fairly easy to get to for the maintenance crew. And really, the only maintenance is changing the filters or cleaning the filters twice a year, we think. And these are, um, I believe, a MERV eight filter, but you can outfit these with a MERV thirteen filter, um, which would take uh, smaller particles out of the air. Um, the boost function is used so that when you go into the bathroom, if it, you are taking a shower or otherwise want to have a higher exhaust level, there's a little button you can push. And for a set period of time, I think it's set at 15 minutes, it will boost to 110 CFM exhaust throughout the building, which will, will, um, will bring in more fresh air. If anybody doesn't understand what an ERV is, basically it exhausts stale air, puts it out through this little um, streams that do not intermix, but move close to one another. And the cool air in the summer or the, excuse me, cool air in the, the yeah, let me do this right. You're exhausting the, the air across the stream. You're getting the heat from the hotter stream and putting it into the cooler stream. So in the summer, you are exhausting air and not bringing in the same hot air from the outside and vice versa. In the winter, you're exhausting the cool air and putting that heat back into the, the stream coming through. This is another example where pushback, we could have gone to a, a better and more expensive ERV with higher efficiencies than this. This one is, a, I think it's about an 82% efficient machine with decent motors, but there are for three or four times the cost, we could have done better and they'd be quieter. So, you know, so is there pushback? No, it's just good choices that we tried to make. Um, I have a quick question. Please. Yes. Um, on those um, ARVs on your diagram before, where is the outside air coming in? That? Yeah, so this was actually a huge challenge. Every unit's different. Um, generally, we are bringing outside air in from under the eaves. Uh, or through the, that's, that's where we, we tried to go for the two-story units in particular, but they're not always, it's not always easy to get there. We did not 
do, I actually have another project underway right now. We've made some provisions for this. We had a hard time sneaking our duct work through and um, to the detriment, I think, of the, uh, how hard those things are gonna have to work to get the air through because we have resistance in the ducts, but they are not all the same. So we didn't want to exhaust under the eaves because we didn't want to exhaust humid air under the eaves where you get condensation, but we did bring in air from under the eaves. Um, we exhausted uh, various places through the walls on top. Uh, and we, never, we did dryers on the roofs. We didn't do these. So I guess through the walls, through the walls. We actually looked at an option of break, taking them all through the attic and going through gable vents in the attic. And unfortunately, just the additional, uh, the cost of the additional ductwork um, made it, uh, uh, it was something we had to cut out. We couldn't do it. It would have had me fewer penetrations. And that would, that's why we wanted to do that. Thank you. Um, so all electric. So uh, I'm taking longer than I thought, and I apologize. But the all electric option was something we decided to do. Originally, we had looked at um, biomass heating. And the biomass heating was going to be a district system. That was very, very expensive. And we quickly abandoned it in favor of a propane fired boiler in each building. They could be relatively small because they were efficient units. And each, each building would have a 500 gallon very propane tank. That's how we went into construction. When we went to all electric, we had two choices. One was to go to a mini split system, heat pump, the air to air heat pump system, uh, which are available to heat buildings down to, you know, efficiently down to 20 degrees maybe, and below that down to about 12, 15 below at less efficiencies, but they're great because they also give you cooling. Um, would have been nice to be able to consider this, but the cost of doing it was just astronomical. We couldn't do that and improve the envelope, so we had to abandon that. And at the recommendation of uh, the folks from Efficiency Vermont, we decided to look at just simple resistance heaters. Shires typically does not air condition their buildings, so we didn't need that. And simple resistance baseboard heat, something that was you know prom prevalent in the 50s, is what we ended up using. But because these buildings are so energy efficient, the envelopes are so good, uh, we, we don't have very much of it. Yeah, Madison's showing how short these things are. That's what it takes to heat this building, though it's in a few rooms. And we have, of course, way more BTU potential than we need because by the time you break it up and distribute it throughout the place and buy the shortest units you can, you know, you have more than you need. So it's going to be easy to heat. Um, of course, we limit the temperatures, so that would limit the energy use as well. Um, the other great advantage of these is that they're um, maintenance free, right? In, in, uh, I think Shires typically maintains each, each of its boilers twice a year, services each of its boilers twice a year. And there's never going to be a fuel delivery, and there's never going to be any maintenance to these. I mean, they could probably get vacuumed out if, now and then. Um, and that's it. So the energy code allows this. The 2015 energy code did. Um, there was no restriction whatsoever on, on this, although there was certainly, uh, it does rub some people the wrong way because its efficiency is, is so far below heat pumps. It's at 100%, but it's way below heat pump over the course of the year. But we were very close to the six BTUs per square foot per hour at design temperature, which is still low enough that in, in multifamily housing that would allow this. If we were under current energy code, we would have to do a slightly better envelope in order to use this FEMI code compliant. We did not require a variance of any sort or anything else, but um, it did give us the advantage of being way less expensive than any other system. Uh, by the way, the, all of the heating and domestic hot water costs are on the house meters and are paid for by the owner. So this is the, uh, trying to go a little quicker, the domestic hot water system. We're using a Senco 2 or San CO2. I'm not sure how you're supposed to say that system. It's a heat pump based water system. And interesting, didn't even occur to me when we started looking at this, Whereas the heat pumps that we typically look at are running at a top COP of about 3.5 to 4, COP being coefficient of performance. This runs closer to a COP of 5, maybe even 6 over the course of the year because we're heating water just as much in the summer as we are in the winter. So when we heat water and it's 80 degrees outside, we're getting a huge energy boost from these things. Obviously in the winter when it's 10 below outside, they're running at a COP of maybe only about 2, which is still a lot better. Interesting about these, a lot of interesting things about these. 
One is that, um, though this is one of our buildings, you see there are two units sitting outside the mechanical room. Each unit feeds a single 83 gallon tank and the water actually circulates outside, outside of the unit and into the, uh, into the heat pump. So rather than a, a uh, coolant or refrigerant running into the building and the compression cycle working that way, um, you actually have water running out, outdoors, which is challenging for a variety of reasons, which I don't need to go into. But the other really interesting thing is that the refrigerant that's used is CO2, and hence the name. So CO2 has a uh, global warming uh, potential of one by definition, and the global warming potential of other refrigerants is measured in relation to that. So the most common, um, as I understand it, the most common refrigerant currently being used is the R22 coolant. And R22 has a, um, has a GWP of 1,810. So it's 1,810 times more damaging to the uh, as a global warming gas as CO2 is. So we think of CO2 as a terrible thing, but you know, it certainly does, is a global warming gas. But as refrigerants go, it's extremely, uh, it's, it's far, far better than the most common ones that are used. So we have two 83 gallon tanks in each building. Plus, um, here's some pushback we got. Stephanie Lane believes we need backup for everything. She's been proven right in the past, so I can't contradict her. But we did put a resistance tank into each building as well, a 60 gallon resistance tank. One of the advantages is the resistance tank um, has a far, far faster uh, recoup time. These take a lot longer, all heat pumps take a lot longer to heat water, but it does give us that much more storage. So we'll be storing, uh, what is that, 100 and 220 so, some odd gallons of water, and we'll be storing it at 160 degrees. I suspect those resistance tanks will be nothing but an additional storage tank. They'll never actually be heating water, um, I hope. I'm gonna jump on to the next and we can come back with questions at the end if that's okay. Um, so these are the, the uh, photovoltaics. So in the end, we had some money left over, which was great. Part of that may have been because of some of the efficiencies we used in the heating systems. We had money left over in any case, enough money to put a photovoltaic system on all of, all of the four buildings. Um, this is showing you building uh, one. Building two down here is, has a mirror image. You're seeing we have it on both sides of the L's and on the south facing side of the main building, uh, the main wing. And then on building four, we have, of course, just on the south side. And then on building three, which was the long, narrow one, we have it on the south side as well. Um, we worked with uh, Energy Guru of North Bennington to do this design. They, those were the designs, those are the designs that we built to with a slight change, which that's not worth going into. And the data for that was this. Those are the five or six different options we looked at. So we, we actually built the 57.8 kilowatt system um, which uh, you can look at the price of the system as well. And the payback, as you can see on each of them is a seven year payback. So we're gonna be, have, we're gonna be achieving from this, according to their estimates, um, 1,800, excuse me, 1,082 kilowatts per year for every kilowatt we installed or a total kilowatt, is it on here? Uh, I guess it's not on here. So 57.8, let's say 60 times 1,000. So about 60,000 kilowatt hours a year, um, which will then pay itself back in seven years, after which those 60,000 kilowatts every year will be free. So these are guaranteed at 20 years and generally are, people are looking at 25 or more years of life on these panels. So we should have, um, we should have free electricity which we estimate to uh, be able to offset about 60% of the house load, the heating and hot water load, or about 70% of the cost because we get a, boat, we get a, a two cent per kilowatt hour bonus from GMP for that. Um, so I'd zoom through those last couple of things, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, to take us back a little bit, Wayne had asked, is it straight resistance um, heat or electric hydronic? No, it's straight resistance. Good question. Um, we did not look at the, the storage, the, the hydronic, the electric hydronic, but I quite, I, I do believe we wouldn't have been able to afford it. It's, I'm, I'm using it on another project and, and I see the advantages to it. Um, I don't think I've been in one of these units when the heat's been on yet. I'm Madison, I don't know if the heat's on in that unit tonight, um, but it is- I'm comfortable, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> We have, we do have the thermal mass of the floors 
And I don't know whether or not that really will, would offset the thermal mass of, a, of the resistance hydronic, but it's straight resistance. They're nice looking though. That's the, that's the variety we got. So they're relatively nice looking ones uh, as opposed to some, but uh, other than that, they're just your standard, you know, Home Depot, plug it in the wall and get 100% of that energy out as heat. It's like heating with light bulbs. Okay. The reason I ask is has has to do with um, we I've I've installed electric hydronic in other houses and the advantage to us was that we didn't originally the, the house wasn't originally we didn't originally plan to use electric heat and by using electric uh, electric hydronic we were able to use uh, we were able to heat approximately 900 square feet with a single 20 amp breaker um, because of the the efficiency of the power load on the on the hydronics. Um, because you're heating up a small amount of oil that is, you know, that's then producing heat over a longer period of time. Um, they are more expensive. I was just curious because, uh, you know, you guys did such a, from my perspective, you guys did such a great job on, on pretty much everything else you did. And, um, and I, I don't really know what the difference in cost is between the straight resistance because I've never priced that stuff. Yeah. But if that was the reason driving it, I can understand it. it it's really cheap. Um, I don't know. We didn't price it. And it's a really good question. Um, I mean, obviously, it's still, you're still paying for all the electricity. And unless you are, I, I know the where I'm the other project I'm looking at has old, um, uh, it's not electric hydronic, they're calling it uh, electric with storage. I, I can't remember the name of these old, the old, you know, floor mounted ones. Um, and they were hooked up to buy power at night. So they had they had double meters on every unit. And so they were heating right. up at night and that was going to save them actually save them electrical costs. But I don't think that arrangement's even available anymore uh, for residential. Um, so that wouldn't give us the advantage. It's, it's a good question. No, we didn't, we didn't look into it. Yeah. There's a company called that that makes a brand called soft heat that is worth looking into as an alternative to the straight resistance. Um, uh, I, I think they're, from my perspective, if I were using electric heat on any project moving forward, that would definitely be a consideration. Just, just a thought. No, I think that's great. Uh, it's a good thought. And I would love, to, I'm, I'm going to compare the price just for my own sake to try to convince myself that we didn't miss an opportunity, but uh, it's not something we considered. And to that, um, again, it wasn't pushback because everybody was on the same side of this, but making the decision to go all electric um, one of the, one of the things that would have helped us go all electric was GMP's assistance with their, uh, tier three money. And they did give us a small amount. I, I say small, it was small relative to what they committed. So they committed a very large amount because they were only looking at the propane savings, which is typically how they can, how they decide what they're going to award. But when the, we had the local guy, the guy who we were dealing directly with was committed that. And then he came back to us and said, when he sent it up the ladder, it was denied. And it was denied because we were not using the most efficient heat source. And although he said he understood the reasoning for our decisions, they denied it. And then they did come back and give us a smaller about, I think about a third or a quarter to a third of what they'd originally given us. But had we gone to heat pumps, we would have had a much, much larger award, but nowhere close to the difference in cost between the heat pumps. Right. Yeah, and, and on top of that, as you probably know from doing these, if we were to put the heat pumps in, we probably would need one per unit at most. And so distributing that heat throughout the unit is, is very difficult, especially on a two-story unit. And we were doing this after the design was completed. So right. it would have been almost impossible for us to do the, use the heat pump alternative. Jeffrey, um, this is Zen's side. My house is pretty tight, but I think your houses are being as tight as they are and having the insulation you have, I think that's a perfect choice for those. Uh, I have heat pumps in my house and uh, I had one in my dining room, one in my living room. I pulled the one out of the dining room, one eats the whole first floor. So uh, right. it's a three story and I have two outdoor units that are 20 amp breakers and one that is very much insulated and, and airtight is really the way to go. Super. Proud of you what you did there. Are there others? Uh, we did get a question. I don't know if you remember the question that I asked you earlier today when yeah. we 
Um, the water lines are exposed. Can you explain what's going on with that? Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So the water lines run, out, as I said, out of the mechanical rooms and into the uh, into the heat pumps. And again, I can't zoom in on this, um, but you can see them coming through the wall here. And this was taken today. They're not yet insulated. They will be insulated. And there's, I think, two, a two-inch insulation that goes onto those water pipes. This, by the way, is the standard installation. It's not. There's nothing unusual about how we put these in. Um, we will be running a heat trace cable with each of those water lines on the copper inside the uh, inside the, the uh, insulation and they, right up into the unit. That is the standard installation for these units, and it goes, I think, three feet inside on the copper pipes inside the inside the mechanical room. Um, that's not a whole lot of distance, and I believe I believe we have a six watt per per foot heat tape. So we're going to have something like 16 feet per unit, something like 100 watts of heat trace tape. 100 watts is, you know, I'd rather not use 100 watts of heat trace tape to heat pipes outside, but it's not a whole lot of energy to use. And the way it's set up is um, it's there, obviously, because we're running hot water outside. When it's running, which it's, you know, most of the time or much of the time, uh, we have no problem with freeze up as long as it's running. When it stops running, um, and it would only stop running during a power outage, those pipes could, the, the 150 degree water, 160 degree water, eventually could, could lose, its, uh, lose its heat and you could actually end up with a freeze up. Sandin says go 24 hours in our, in our climate and they're not worried about freezing. I'm not so sure 24 hours seems like a long time to leave even very hot water outdoors, even with that much insulation. But with the heat trace tape, um, obviously, you know, it should keep it warm. And we decided to put the heat trace tape, back it up with a, an uninterruptible power supply. So we're, each of these is going to have a UPS in it. And that's going to keep it going for another 24 to 48 hours. So in a 24 to 48 hour heat loss or t uh, energy out or power outage in the deepest of winter, we should be fine. The choice we had to make was Sandin gives you the choice to add a dump option where when the power goes out, it dumps the water to keep it from freezing. The problem is there's no time delay and there's no temperature sensing. So it's going to dump that water in the middle of the summer if you have a thunderstorm that knocks the power out for two minutes. And then the maintenance guys are going to come back and they're going to have to refill this whole system and start it up again. That seemed like a really bad alternative. So we decided not to take that option, but instead go with UPS in each building. And they actually offered us an extended warranty if we did that. So I think they gave us a five-year extended warranty on the system because we had had that conversation with them in advance. So the answer to your question is, um, we think we've dealt with it with the insulation and the heat trace, ta the heat trace cables and the uninterrupted power supply. That's all the questions that I see in the chat. Oh. While, while I'm here on this on this page, I had meant to point out the two energy guides. The, the one on the left, $154 gallon, $150 a year for running it, that's on the Sandin unit, the 83 gallon unit. Okay. And this is obviously, I just took it because I was I thought it was great to see. Um, I don't know who does these ratings, but whatever the whatever the government or group is or whoever they contract to do these ratings. So $154 to run the 83 unit, 83 gallon unit for a year. This is on the resistance heat, six hundred and forty-seven dollars on a sixty-gallon unit. So I'm looking at that and saying, you know, this is four times as this is one quarter or less than one quarter of this, and you know, given that this is also um, thirty percent bigger, we're looking at if this is a COP of one, this must be a COP of about five, and they're estimating that for around you know all year. Obviously, it's cl it's climate dependent, but so we're looked. I I do expect to see a COP of about five on the sanding units. And that's what I've used in my calculations for uh, estimating the amount of, of energy savings with the, the solar. Anything else? Hi, Jim. Um, we do have um, Stephanie Lane, our executive director on the line. And I think this question might be better for her. Um, Jeff asked about how many jobs were created by this project and how long did it take to construct and get COs? Oh, it took us about 
almost exactly 12 months to construct, um, even with the COVID delay, which is really pretty amazing. We had a really incredible construction crew. Um, we, as, as much as we can, we always encourage local subs to apply and to submit bids for these. And we did have some locals, which is great. Um, I think the, the painters were local. Thaler and Breen was the uh, construction manager, but they hired local subs underneath them, like Marshall Plumbing and Heating. Um, we sourced our appliances locally at Home Depot. So in terms of jobs, that's a good question. I don't know how many it created, but I know it supported a lot of jobs. And uh, we had significant crews on site every day. And, uh, you know, we, we sourced our materials locally. And, uh, you know, so that that's an interesting question and we should look at that more carefully, but it's certainly an economic driver for the area and a big investment in, in a small, you know, rural part of Vermont in Shaftesbury. And I think, you know, certainly supported a lot of local businesses. Right, and, and maintenance as well. We source a lot of that locally. Um, all of our maintenance is local contractors and local purchases, absolutely. And we insist on, you know, appliances being purchased locally. Also a site, we had a site contractor was local and we had uh, all of the landscape was done locally. Yep, Pembroke Landscaping, North Bennington. Yeah, I, I, I asked the question just because it's, it's great what you've done there. I, my hat's off to all of you. Great teamwork. And, but you hear a lot about you know, the green economy and not to get a political at all. But you just want to have a stat that says, you know, here's a project right down the road. I'm in Sunderland, by the way. Right down the road that you know, employed this many people for this amount of time. It will continue to do that uh, as, it, uh, as maintenance is needed. Plus, most importantly, it has given you know, a home to 22 families or whatever. So yeah, I, I, I encourage you to just check into that one little bullet type status to, you know, how much it did help the local economy by, by building this project. And, and congratulations again. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Well, one, one note is um, not, a, not a building technology question, but a comment, first of all, I think it, um, given that transportation is our biggest energy demand and greenhouse gas producer, I think that it's worth noting that the location of the project and the location of similar projects like this is really important. That it's, you know, it's really walkable to a village center, um, notwithstanding the intervening mess of the Vermont rail line, but it's, it's very close to the village center and a lot of services and school and everything else is really important. And I was just wondering if, I don't, it might be a question for Stephanie, but um, you know, one, one thing I always hear from folks when we're talking about electric vehicles is that folks in multifamily housing and apartments are really um, cut out of the EV market because they don't have charging infrastructure. And like, what what types of considerations are made for EV charging in this and future projects? That's also a good question. Um, actually, Madison and I had discussed this and whether, I know she had worked on some work for the BCRC regarding the charging stations. Um, and it's something that we would consider probably in the future, um, including that in the scope on new construction projects. I think we could certainly consider an installation at this site if it seems warranted. And I think it makes sense. You know, we've gone, we've taken the extra steps to do the right thing on this project. And I think, you know, that certainly would put a, a cherry on top, so to speak. <laughs> I think it would be great if we could- also add, it. Um, as a new plug-in hybrid owner, uh, one thing that I'm really excited about at this development is that there's outdoor outlets <laughs> uh, so you can definitely trickle charge if you have an all electric vehicle. It'll take a while, but um, so I think I have a couple comments. Um, one is we we put those outdoor char outdoor plugs in because it's required by code now, and it's, it's basically because people ran their Christmas lights through their doors and uh, plugged them on the inside, and then they would short because the door would scrape against the, the wire. But it, it's nice to know that there's a better reason. Um, and the other is it. it Certainly something that we've talked about. I, I can't remember now, Stephanie, whether you and I had a conversation or, you know, about the electric vehicle charging. Um, 
we are encouraged to minimize the number of parking places at these sites. And we're often, we're often criticized for the fact that there may be not enough because maybe there aren't, there aren't two per, um, there aren't always two cars per apartment. Uh, code doesn't require two per apartment. And certainly Jim, your, your colleagues down in Bennington are, are discouraging us as whenever possible from building as many parking places as might be needed in order to encourage people to use other forms of transportation. And then when we put the charging stations in, we reserve those places for electric vehicles. And so we have empty charge, empty parking places, much like we have empty parking places a lot of times for handicapped parking places because we don't happen to have somebody who, who has the handicap tag. So it's, a, it's an interesting um, push and pull. You know, we want to minimize the number of parking places. We want to maximize the green space. But at the same time, we want to provide that. And I, I know that one of the solutions is to simply wire for them now. And as the need becomes more and more uh, obvious, to put them in then. And we did not on this site, but it's obviously easy to do. I mean, it's not hard at all to, to put a, in the future, to put one in. At Advocate, um, at my work, we put in two charging stations and Green Mountain Power uh, bought the level two chargers for us. So um, it's a pretty good time to have some on hand if you're thinking about having an electric vehicle. And uh, level two charged my, um, Clarity in about two and a half hours, where level one plugging it into 110 is five or six hours. That's good to know. Hey, Jeff, did you guys consider, um, as far as the parking was concerned, and I know price, believe me, Stephanie, I know the uh, pricing on this is going to be a big, was, is going to be a big, big part of the answer, but did you guys consider permeable pavement as uh, for your parking? as an alternative where you can maybe provide more parking spaces without having much more of an impact on the, on the environment or. So here's so just, yeah, I, we could have done more. We could have done permeable pavement that that would have been allowed, but we still have to consider our pavements as impermeable in terms of the state as, as they, as I understand it, when they look at um, stormwater management, we were within, I forgot. I know when we, when we put our, our picnic deck in, we had to do a deck with open, an open deck that water would get through because if we paved that much more area and we're talking about 300 square feet, yeah. we, would have, we would have had to reapply for our stormwater permit through the state. We were at the very limit of the number of square feet uh, of, of impermeable pavement that was allowed. And therefore the additional cost associated with putting in permeable pavement uh, of any sort would have been and it's just simply an additional cost because it would not have offset the the, the costs of our stormwater management. And there was a very right. expensive system. I didn't realize that Vermont, well, I, I just assumed that permeable pavement changed the equation as far as the calculation on, on stormwater runoff. Yeah, I'm not a civil engineer and I can't tell you the details, but even dirt roads um, are considered impermeable. Dirt paths are impermeable. And we were literally at the the hairy edge of not being able to- The very right edge, the bleeding edge, I get it. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> well then I'll, I'll jump in and say, um, unless there's any questions, thank you for a, uh, a superb presentation and, and a great project, really. It's, uh, it's one we can use an ex as an example for, for other projects in our region and around the state. So great job. Thank you everyone for your interest and for joining us. I got one, one more quick comment. If I know everybody's kind of antsy to get off. Yeah. Um, Stephanie and Jeff. Um, yeah, Jeff, you mentioned that during the aero sealing that you didn't have any issues with, uh, you know, un unwanted sealing of windows. And you also mentioned that the windows weren't the top of the line. They were, I mean, to me, that's pretty top of the line if you're using Marvin. Um, might not be a bad idea to talk to Marvin about the fact that their windows, uh, you know, survived a, an aero seal activity and were still fully operational afterwards. Because that means the windows were sealed, were, you know, were sealing well on their own without, uh, that they, they were doing a good job of sealing to begin with. Right. Um, and it might be a way to get some, you know, some recognition um, 
it never hurts to free marketing is, you know, it never hurts. Sure. It's a good point. I, I, I was very impressed. And I say they're not great windows. I look, they're not passive house rated windows. You know, they're not I mean, they're the kind of window that's intended. If actually, if I look, when I originally looked at our air sealing goals, my comment was, we're not going to meet them. That 0.2 air changes per hour sounds great, but we're never going to get there because if I look at the leakage ratings on those windows, we don't meet that. Those parts of the walls have a much higher leakage rating than the walls themselves or than the, than the overall average for the building. So I don't know that I did a calculation right. adding up all the windows and looking at exactly what those leak, that leakage would be relative to the rest of the wall. But I did note that the leakage on those windows was greater than, than the goal we were trying to achieve. So we were actually performing, I think we were performing far better than the ratings on those windows. And when I say these are Marvins, just so you know what we're looking at, it's what the, used to be the, uh, the wood Ultrex windows. So they're now called- The Integrity. The, the, well, yeah, they don't call them that anymore, but yes, Integrity Lines now called the Elevate, I think. I think that's yeah, it. it's been a long time since, but you're talking about the pull treated- uh, Yes. The treated fiberglass windows. Yep, yep. So and I, me, that's I, even more surprising. More surprising? Yeah, it, I mean, because they, back when I was doing a lot of renovation work, the Marvin Ultimates were all, almost entirely wood, but they were extremely tight windows for the for the era. And the, the Ultrex were, you know, they were a lower price point, so you would sort of expect them to be leakier. And the fact that they're passing, that you know, that they're getting this, getting through this without clogging up with uh, with caulk is a, is a pretty good marketing plan yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Their, their performance ratings are actually at least as good as the stand as the ultimates now. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Because they it, weren't it's, before. It's just stable. It's product. been a while. Yeah. Right. Good choice, by the way. I mean, from my perspective, for what you guys are doing, that, that particular window would have been a good choice. It, it wasn't, it was, it was our first choice, but not our, not our, we didn't know we'd get there. We thought we were going to have to compromise and do something different. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you.